Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's session about feature engineering with Hamilton. Here we are today. Today's speaker is Stefan Krasovs. He's the CEO of DAG Works INC. Stefan is the author of the popular open source framework called Hamilton, and he has been a guest lecturer at Stanford Machine Learning Systems Design course. He spent over 15 years working across multiple parts of the stack. For the last decade, he has focused primarily on data, machine learning related systems, and their connection to building product applications. He has built many zero to one and one to three versions of these systems at places like Stanford, Honda Research, LinkedIn, Nextdoor, Idibun, and Stitch Fix. Wow, wonderful. We are delighted to be part of the session and the stage is all yours, Stefan. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, let me just share my screen. Chat window. Cool. Uh, well, um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, and so, uh, yeah, my name is Stefan Krafczyk, uh, CEO of a company called Dagworks, Dag for Direct Day Cycle Graph. Uh, and I'm you know, excited to talk to you about yeah, an open source project uh, I kind of created at Stitch Fix before I started uh, the company Dagworks uh, and going to be talking about uh, feature engineering. Um, and so, uh, do feel free to you know, put questions in the QA and chat. And so, I'll try to, uh, if I don't see them, I'll, you know, that things will be flagged to me, but otherwise, um, uh, if I'm my accent is a problem or I'm going too quickly, uh, do feel free to um, yeah stop and, and pause and ask questions. Uh, in terms of uh, just a little bit more about myself, uh, so yeah, I've been in Silicon Valley since you know, 2007, so I've been here a while. I've uh, been at a various bunch of companies. Um, uh, in terms of where, uh, you know, I, I created Hamilton and a lot of kind of uh, my learnings in terms of. Uh, uh, in terms of yeah, helping get you know uh, production or things from prototype to production for data or machine learning purposes was at a company called Stitch Fix. Uh, for those who don't know, Stitch Fix was famous for having uh, over 100 uh, data scientists. And so I was you know, engineering for data science uh, for them. And so in which case, this is where uh, I created the, the open source uh, project uh, Hamilton was to help a particular team there. Um, uh, in terms of just to give you a bit of a mindset for this talk, so I'm going to do a quick high level like overview just to kind of frame some of the positioning, right? Um, in, in kind of five slides, and then I'm going to uh, talk about you know actually get into the, to the talk. Um, so uh, some of the primary motivations for me in terms of you know booting out Hamilton and then therefore uh, applying it to kind of feature engineering was kind of uh, uh, it can be represented in, 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 in the two sides of this um, slide here. Uh, so imagine you are coming into some sort of project and you're inheriting uh, some sort of code. Uh, one percent of it looks like this, or or, or the alternative is, is you know you have two choices. So it either looks like on the left hand side or the right hand side. This isn't a complete representation. This is you know only short short snippet. Um, in terms of you know just to make sure that I you know haven't put you all to sleep yet, uh, do you guys have preferences for w which code would you rather inherit, or or or, or, or yeah, if you were to come into to a code base? Um, you can say right side. Got some votes for right. Anyone? Anyone for the left? Right. Some people on the left. Cool. A little split. That's nice. Um, and then what if I told you that like, hey, look, the the right hand side, everything's unit testable, documentation friendly, right? Uh, whereas the left hand side doesn't really have these things, you know. And so uh, on the right hand side, you could reuse the the, the functions as, as they're kind of written, but on the left hand side, you'd have to kind of refactor. Maybe you maybe you'll just cut and paste. Does that change anyone's um, uh, you know, perspectives? Yep. Um, so, uh, so the right hand side is effectively Hamilton. So I'm going to describe and talk about it. But effectively, the idea with Hamilton is trying to help standardize how you describe work, and you can use it for data, machine learning, LM, and kind of you know even web workflows. Um, I'll get into this, but effectively, Hamilton has this nice uh, uh, you know duality between if you can write uh, draw a directed acyclic graph or a, or, or what, uh, some sort of uh, flow, you can kind of get a visualization. So you're always going to have this nice uh, duality between understanding code and having something visual. So at a high level, you're effectively going to be talking about uh, uh, this applied to feature engineering, uh, but that this is kind of the, the things that I kind of, uh, you know, want, want to press on you is like, yeah, code cleanliness quality and like coming into a, to a code base that you don't know. So um, to motivate, you know, why, why was Hamilton created in the, in the first place? So let me let me walk you through the situation uh, as it was at Stitch Fix. Um, so uh, 
there was a, a data science team that was tasked with forecasting, you know, operational forecast for the business. The business would make decisions with these forecasts. So for example, you know, how many warehouse workers should we have given the expected client demand, right? Um, uh, but, you know, the world moves and so does time, you know, marketing campaigns, you know, stop and start. They could drive different, you know, client traffic. And so their pipeline for these forecasts kind of look like the following, right? You know, you, you get some actuals, they'll featureize it, fit models, and then, you know, prick the future and do something with it. Uh, because of, uh, and so the biggest problem in terms of this pipeline, you know, wasn't get, getting it set up initially. It was actually iterating and, you know, uh, say adding more features and dealing uh, um, to, to make better forecasts. And so this is what Hamilton was, you know, uh, set out to solve was to really help them streamline and uh, make this much, uh, make the problems they had with dealing, maintaining, and creating kind of uh, features, uh, you know, something that, uh, you know, yeah, basically remove that pain point for them. Um, so to ground that, let me show you, just show, show you some code. Um, I'm going to go through some pandas code, and I'm going to assume people here know Python. Um, um, uh, but effectively, the script that was kind of, uh, you know, the code that uh, was in this kind of featureized part kind of can be characterized uh, in the following way. There was some, you know, the initial parts of the code was to load, load some data. Um, uh, so this would be a kind of actuals. Uh, then potentially maybe based on configuration, there would be different code paths, right? So, you know, uh, Stitch Fix used to operate in the US and the UK. So there are, you know, different features that might be required because they have different holidays, right? Um, uh, then there were, uh, people would write kind of, you know, features as one line incantations, right? Uh, maybe they would then, you know, add, basically they're adding to a, a data frame that would, um, these features. And so maybe they would also, you know, delegate these things out to functions, right? And then at the end of it, um, they would come and, you know, save this data frame to some location. So then it could be picked up, uh, for the next step to do, uh, you know, uh, model training. I want to say this script looks pretty nice. Uh, it's, it's short. You're like, what's the problem, Stefan? But I want to say, you know, picture the passions of time. Um, you know, people are going to come and go, um, from your team, uh, invariably with machine learning and kind of work and feature engineering in particular, you generally always adding things, right? And so things are only getting to get more complex and more sophisticated. So you're always doing append or like you're just adding to the to the code, really. And it very rarely remove it. Um, uh, and so uh, if you were to come to try to update, change, you know, and say, you know, if, if the world moves and, you know, something about the schema of this changes, right? You know, how do you, you know, be confident in, in the things that you're doing? Well, um, if you are dealing with code that kind of looks like this, it's, it's you know, uh, maybe easy and quick to get out, but like, you know, there is no unit testing or integration testing story, right? So if I was to change a particular feature definition, how do I know I haven't kind of broken anything very easily? Well, it didn't start with tests, so, you know, therefore it's kind of hard to add tests. Uh, and then this impacts data quality, right? So like, where do you measure? Where do you put the checks in, um, uh, uh, et cetera? Um, you might have some, you know, like uh, code readability and documentation is is you know hard to stick in here. So you're a new person, you're getting a wall of text, right? But in terms of you know why is why is average three weeks spend or the three you know number important, right? There isn't really a great place or standard place that you can kind of you know document this, right? You could do inline documentation, but then you know it's not really um, uh, you know I, I want to say done uh, in a standard way uh, by everyone. Uh, and then as the script kind of grows, you know, as the thing said, things get more complex. So how do you actually understand the dependencies of, you know, the first part of the code with the last part, right? You don't know that unless you've read the entire thing and kind of known it kind of uh, end to end uh, and, and intimately, right? And so if I was to change acquisition cost, like I would have to know that, oh, look, there's an assumption. There could be an assumption in multiple columns that, you know, acquisition cost is, you know, has some sort of shape, right? And so uh, I wouldn't, I could potentially impact, uh, you know, break span B without really knowing it because, you know, I I thought I was just touching something independent, but then, you know, I, I didn't actually know who was using it downstream. In terms of, you know, uh, iteration, right? So usually, you know, you get something to production, but then you're iterating, right? So then, you know, it could be you you, you want to create a, another pipeline for another, you know, type of model or something, or maybe you're you're you know you're doing some modifications, you're tweaking things. Ideally, if there are things that are common, you should be sharing them, right? And so there's, because there's, you know, uh, you know, less maintenance cost involved. But if you write code in this kind of a style, right, then the luckiest and the easiest thing is it should cut and paste. But then that proliferates, you know, definitions of things. So then if you're given an, uh, an output and you're finding something, you're like, where is the code that actually, you know, computes this, right? There's no, oh no, there's now several places where this could come from potentially, right? And so um, the uh, code in the style isn't amenable to being reused. And then this naturally kind of impacts kind of onboarding and debugging. 
Um, so at Stitch Fix, there were over a thousand features um, uh, before we brought in Hamilton. And so this, this, this effectively, uh, it took a long time for someone to be ramp up to be productive uh, and in a way that they didn't break things. And so if, if so effectively to debug, the people who could debug the code base the quickest were the most tenured on the team, right? And so uh, as, as this kind of grew, you know, things, things kind of got worse. Um, so uh, question for you. Um, are any of these pain points familiar to you? If so, which ones? Feel free to you know type into the chat. Um, um, I don't know if you can actually unmute, uh, but you know if you if you want to say that's also fine. But um, just curious, does this does this um, uh, resonate? These pains resonate with anyone? Got one? Yes. Reusability is one. Yep. Um, yeah, reusability. Yeah, <laughs> lack of interest. Great. Great. Um, w yeah. W w would you want to inherit code that you know, that was like this? Like, would you be in anguish if your colleague suddenly just left and you're like, oh, your manager's like, hey, now you you're owning this, right? Um, yep. That, yep. It's a good comment. Yeah. Hard to read other people's code if documentation isn't clear. Um, uh, anyone else want to want to add before I move on? Um, so on to, so let me explain what Hamilton is. Um, in one sentence, I would say it's a micro orchestration framework uh, for defining data flows using declarative functions. So that's mouthful. I'll unpack that in the next couple of slides. High level, as I kind of alluded to at the beginning, you kind of get these nice software engineering best practices of everything being testable, documentation friendly, and it has this great modularity reuse story. Um, uh, it's just a library, so it's not a system. All you need to do is just be able to, um, uh, you, you can install it in any Python environment. If you're bored of me and you want to play around with it in your browser, you can go to tryhamilton.dev. Uh, um, so let me unpack that sentence. So what do I mean by micro orchestration? Well, the contra is macro. Um, and so macro orchestration in terms of machine learning and kind of feature engineering, generally uh, you, I'm, I'm referring to uh, things that handle the entire pipeline. So the macro, the high level. So Airflow being a macro orchestrator is something that you can use to you know, schedule a different sequence of computational tasks that are strung together. Or, or maybe you're using DBT, for example, as, as well. Ah. So macro is like, how do I orchestrate this thing end to end and get the computational units running on different resources, right, and scheduled? Um, micro orchestration is, 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 is smaller. So focusing on like the innards of what's happening in one particular step. So specifically uh, in the context of, say, Airflow or DBT, it is, uh, you know, focusing on what is the code that is actually being run in that particular task. And so Hamilton's focus is on that part, like trying to help make sure that that is the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, easier to iterate, understand and debug since at Stitch Fix, you know, in the case of the, the, that particular team, the macro was not the problem. It was the micro and being able to iterate and confidently change things in tasks without, you know, breaking uh, things downstream. What is a data flow? Uh, it is just a fancy computer science term for saying how data and computation flow. Um, and the main point is it can be expressed as a uh, directed acyclic graph or a DAG. And this is where, you know, DAG from uh, why I started the company called DAGWorks, because, you know, I'm all about this kind of representation of things. So this feature engineering code here uh, is, you know, can be described uh, as a data flow, right? Because we can actually draw... Um, you know, some uh, 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 nodes and then add edges and say, these are dependencies. So to compute spend per signup, I need signups and, and spend. If I want spend zero mean unit variance, I need, you know, zero mean standard deviation and zero mean st uh, spend zero mean requires spend mean, which requires, you know, both of them require spend, right? And so uh, this is, uh, you know, it can be, uh, this feature computation can be expressed as a, as a data flow or, or a directed acyclic graph. What do I mean by declarative functions, right? So when the, 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 the you're just writing regular Python code um, and the Python function name effectively says or declares uh, something you can get out and the function input arguments, you know, declare what the actual dependencies are required for computation. Um, uh, yeah, I know, uh, yes, I'll, I can post the slides after the talk um, um, or, or provide them. So um, definitely you can use them as a reference. Um, the, the interesting thing is that you don't run these functions directly. That's kind of what Hamilton does. But the idea is like you should be able to read the code and you understand what it does and what it needs. Um, and the reason for this kind of way uh, kind of came up with, I'm sure you're 
may be familiar with is that, hey, look, something's happening with a model and I need to understand what it is. So I need to go check, say, the training feature set. And so then variable leads you to kind of uh, look at some tabular data and go, okay, uh, this feature looks funny. Well, how is that computed? How easy is that for you to find the definition for that code, right? And so the idea with Hamilton was that, okay, given this output um, uh, data frame, can we make it as easy as possible to, you know, given that particular feature, find the corresponding code for it? And so the idea was that, you know, uh, everything should correspond exactly to one, one Python function. Uh, and then the idea was, well, if you can put it into a function, can we just make it, yeah, very clear and independent to understand what's required uh, to compute things? So uh, uh, just to kind of repeat things, yeah. In, in Hamilton, the output, so for example, a column or a feature is determined by the name of the function and the dependencies of what's required to compute it are determined by the input parameters. So let me show you uh, that in code. Uh, so instead of this kind of procedural way of kind of creating a feature C from summing A and B and a feature D from transforming C, um, uh, the, uh, uh, you would rewrite that into Hamilton to two functions. So we would, uh, given that these are potential two outputs that we want, we would write two functions called C and D. Um, uh, and then in terms of what's required to compute them, we would specify like, look, hey, this C needs A. And so we'd write that as uh, function parameters. We'd use the, the body of the, the function to, to do you know, the regular Python stuff that we need. And then for D, because it only requires C, right, we would you know, just specify that as a dependency. Now, uh, A and B are transited dependencies, but you know, with Hamilton, the idea is that Hamilton knows that to compute D, it requires C. Uh, we can get then, we know then what C is, and we then we know that C requires A and B. So that's kind of, you know, the magic of Hamilton is that it will stitch together to figure out how to compute things. So specifically, uh, a full Hello World example is that you write these fine functions that define this kind of uh, data flow or, you know, set of feature transformation processes. Uh, you then have to write some, you know, what we call some driver or, or you know, a code to kind of run and execute this. Um, what, what you're doing is you're, you're importing you know, Hamilton, but you're also importing this, this, this uh, Python module. Uh, you're then uh, constructing a, a, a driver, which con constructs this directed acyclic graph representation by, you know, you pass in this module, it will crawl these functions, it will create, you know, if each function effectively becomes a node, it will then determine the edges between things. Um, uh, and then, uh, and then you, you t ask Hamilton, like, you know, execute, give me these, these features, right? And so then Hamilton will understand that, hey, what outputs you want, uh, and then we'll understand, uh, it can walk the graph to understand and only compute the paths that are required to kind of compute their results. So rather than having a script where if you want to test one thing or you only want to get some subset out and you have to run everything like with Hamilton, like you, you don't have that because Hamilton can figure out just the, the code paths required to compute uh, the features that you, that you are requesting. Um, one thing to note is like, yeah, this example and what I, uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus on pandas here just because I think that's a very common tool, but Hamilton kind of works for uh, any Python object type. So these could be you know, Polar's data frames. These could be you know, NumPy arrays. This could be your own custom object types. Uh, and Hamilton also you know, works with PySpark as well. Um, so in terms of you know, just in general, uh, when should you consider using Hamilton? Well, if you can draw a flowchart or a directed acyclic graph, you know, Hamilton's, um, yeah, you can put it into Hamilton. So feature engineering is kind of the Hamilton's roots. And so that's the focus of the talk today. But just to kind of anchor and just give you, you know, there, there are many other places that you can use Hamilton. So if you're tired of managing scripts or uh, you, you're building into end machine learning pipelines, or if you have web, web requests, you can kind of use Hamilton there. Or even, you know, uh, LLM workflow. So if you've heard of a tool called Langchain, you know, Hamilton, you can actually, you know, uh, use Hamilton instead to express the, you know, going to open AI and, you know, transforming things. Um, and... Uh, uh, or if you're a code and software best practices enthusiast, then I want to say Hamilton's going to decrease your, you know, uh, code complexity by, you know, uh, helping you structure and, and, and chunk your code in a way that makes things um, uh, much simpler to maintain and manage. But yeah, focus of talk today is feature engineering. So, um, uh, and then just yeah, just mentioned, you know, Hamilton has been around for a bit. So there is, I'm not going to show all the breadth and possibilities of, you know, power features and the things that you can kind of do, but suffice to say that you can kind of, uh, you know, annotate functions with different functionalities that can kind of expand its breadth. Uh, and then, uh, I, I won't touch on it, but, you know, Hamilton does have plugins to, you know, make it easy to run on, you know, DBT or scale onto Ray or Dask or Spark, if you know those things. Right. And so, uh, one of the things to note is, yeah, Hamilton is, is very portable, um, uh, as well. Um, in terms of you know, Hamilton adoption, like there's a lot of companies who are using it in production, so you wouldn't be the first. You're in, you'd be in good hands. It's you know, pretty production grade. Uh, we did have to fork the repository from Stitchfix because that's where it originally was. But you know, suffice to say, we've got you know, almost 300 people in our Slack community. So if you need help 
and you're using Hamilton, there, there's, there's, you know, there's a community that can help. Uh, uh, and then otherwise, um, uh, yeah, otherwise people are using it for not just feature engineering, but also uh, various other purposes. So um, on to the, you know, feature engineering. So how do you use Hamilton for it? Um, well, just to give you a bit of a, a picture, so at, at Stitch Fix, we brought in Hamilton and effectively that team grew from managing a thousand, you know, just like 1500, I think, or 1200 uh, features. Uh, the team in the course of, you know, a couple of years after was, you know, managing close to, you know, over 4,000 feature transforms in a single code base. Uh, the team loved it and effectively, you know, they could add more features and, you know, it didn't slow the team down, right? Um, uh, and effectively actually enabled them for their monthly feature engineering kind of uh, model fitting update task. Uh, they used to take someone a day to do it, to be confident, to push something with Hamilton because we simplified the process and made it easy to be confident. It took less than two hours. Um, it was then therefore you know, easier to onboard new, new team members because you had lineage and always up-to-date documentation. Uh, code reviews are faster because everything was you know, standardized in a way of like understanding, hey, you're going to change this. It's going to impact that. right? And then uh, if, if you want to test and you wanted to, to do things, you could really easily test it. Uh, I'll kind of show examples um, in a bit. And then obviously there's plugins with documentation that you can kind of, if you understand Sphinx, uh, you can kind of, um, uh, uh, the code that you write is also generally pretty amenable to, to Sphinx documentation. So uh, at a high level, feature engineering with Hamilton is that you write effectively, you need at least two, two, two Python files, right? Uh, you can have more, more than one Python file that describes your Python functions, but effectively you gotta write something that loads and transforms data. So your feature engineering code, um, you're then going to write this kind of, you know, run.py and instantiate a driver that's going to interpret the functions that you write into a graph. Uh, and then you're going to request what you want from that graph and Hamilton will only walk those paths to kind of create a, a data frame. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, visually, pictorially to kind of expressing that, right. Uh, so with Hamilton, you know, your data lives somewhere in some sort of table. So it's very common therefore to like, you know, write functions that extract from the end of that plate, that SQL table, or from that parquet file, uh, you're then writing, you know, these functions here that are then uh, uh, you're declaring the functions and, and their dependencies. So you kind of build this kind of directed acyclic graph, um, and then you actually can then write multiple run.py functions that you know express or or or, or, or use different parts of what's what's kind of um, uh, uh, defined here uh, to actually materialize and create uh, you know a different data frame. So. Um, so, uh, and, and so this is where you can actually start to build up this kind of feature catalog of sorts, right? Of, of a superset of things, and then only uh, for the particular context that, uh, uh, and, and only compute things for the particular context that's required. So in the case of say Stitch Fix, it'd be you know that have one uh, different context for for US features and another context for for UK features. Um, and then in terms of you know how this impacts the code, right? And so uh, effectively by forcing you into this kind of a paradigm, this way of thinking and organizing things, you actually a natural structure kind of emerges uh, with your code base, right? So features actually you end up grouping features into thematic modules, so or the marketing spend features or the um, uh, you know user features, right? They all kind of start to be grouped into similar modules, right? Um, uh, so then it's easier to create, find, kind of update or even swap out. Um, and then because you're not tightly coupling these definitions. Um, uh, with where uh, 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 where things actually run, right? It's actually then easier to kind of you know reuse things or like hey, if I have a different setup for development and production, it's easier then to kind of um, uh, you know manage and maintain these things. Uh, and so therefore, even if you work in a handoff model with data scientists, you know, handing off to like engineering, this is actually pretty amenable because if the data scientist kind of ends up writing Hamilton code, then it's very easy for the engineer to make heads or tails and wrap it up and kind of use it uh, for that particular context of, of, of where things actually run in production. Um, uh, uh, and so, uh, great, yeah, great insight, uh, Eileen. Yeah, I want to say, yeah, onboarding onto existing projects that have hundreds of features is, is hard. And so, yeah, um, uh, this is where, yeah, it, Hamilton was, was kind of built to kind of you know, help manage and maintain that structure and make it easy to, um, uh, that, yeah, if people leave or new people come in, it's easy to uh, understand and make heads or tails of, of, of what's going on. So what are the benefits of using Hamilton? Um, uh, so here's a function you kind of haven't um, uh, seen before. Uh, I'll, I'll have links at the end, uh, at the end, uh, Alice, so you can definitely uh, take pictures and things, but um, we have, we have uh, a, lo a lot of uh, documentation stuff. So um, uh, in terms of, you know, one of the things I think that to make code amenable and, and useful is like you, you got to have some some testing documentation story right um with hamilton it's kind of um uh you know the functions that you write because they're decoupled from where things run you're effectively forced to kind of inject 
um, like all the things that are required. That means it's actually really easy to unit test, right? And so in which case, um, uh, you know, writing unit tests, so code is always unit testable, right? And so um, therefore, if you want to test something specifically, it's, 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 you know, Hamilton set up to kind of, you didn't have to think about it, right? Because you're forced to kind of write things in this way, but then, oh, look, as a byproduct, everything is great as a great unit testing story. Uh, integration testing as well. So if you want to just compute a particular path, right? Hamilton allows you to kind of write integration tests or, uh, you know, just to test a, a, a particular, particular path. Usually you'd have to spend a lot of feature engineering time or like you'd have to run an entire script to test one subset of it with Hamilton. You know, that's not the case. Um, you can also add, um, uh, you know, runtime data quality checks pretty easily. So in the, in the case of, so we have an, an annotation you can add uh, that you can kind of you know, specify some, you know, some sort of expectations on. Uh, if you're familiar with an, an, another open source project called Pandera, Hamilton, uh, which allows you to define, say, a schema, um, Hamilton also has a, a way that you can plug that in so that when something runs at runtime, you can validate that like the output actually matches your, your expected schema. So you can catch and validate things easier. Uh, the benefit here is that this is all tied in one place in the code. Um, this isn't a separate system. You might've heard of things like great expectations or something like that. Hamilton is just, yeah, just compressing it, shifting it left and like um, uh, moving the expectation to be close with the code. Uh, and then it's, it's self-documented, right? And so you can kind of, uh, because these functions are outputs you can get out, you invariably name them things that are human understandable and readable, right? It's a little more, little more, little more things to type, but then the outcome is that you read code more often than you write it. So then it's easier to come back and go, okay, oh, I understand what this thing is because it's named, as, you know, similar, it's named the same as the output, right? And so you have this uh, natural kind of self-documented code. You have the ability to use doc strings now. So if you actually want more documentation, you have a very standardized place to put it. Uh, and then we also have these annotations. So you can actually tag functions with more information. So if you wanted to understand, you know, who the owner of this is, or does this have PII, like you can tag things with appropriate kind of information and then uh, you can visualize it. So I'll show that on, on the next slide. But effectively, I think with just these, you know, test and great this, this, these uh, set of properties here, it enables you to kind of, you know, I want to say scale the team and, and your code base um, more easily than you than you otherwise would have because you would have to, you know, uh, really think about the software engineering practices and principles to kind of do this. But with Hamilton, it's like, you know, uh, uh, it forces you to write code in the way that this naturally kind of comes about. Um, so visualization, as I said, is, is first class. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, Question from Alice. Um, yeah, when using Hamilton, uh, you need to define a function. So with Hamilton, the idea is uh, Hamilton will figure out how to call which sequence of functions in the right way because of the way that you know things are, 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 are because of the naming. So to compute height uh, zero mean unit variance, Hamilton will know it needs to find either another function height zero mean or height standard deviation to be computed first. Or it, it will, will, if it doesn't find a function, it will expect it as input. So that's how Hamilton figures out you know, how to compute things. And so you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is declare these functions and making sure they have the right dependencies for them to be computed. Um, uh, and, and so uh, visualization is first class. So if there's code that's running in production, you can always draw a picture of it. Right. And so usually your documentation is always out of date. And so in which case you can build, you know, something into your uh, pull request or CI process or something to generate an image and place it in, in, and have, you know, uh, documentation that's always up to date. And so, um, uh, and so this effectively means like the code that you write actually encodes the lineage or the provenance of how things are computed. Um, so what you're seeing here is a, 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 a machine learning pipeline on the Titanic uh, data set, but you can kind of see here that I, uh, you can kind of see the lineage of what's required to create a training set. You can kind of see what features, uh, what derived features were kind of created, right? Uh, and so this is where, um, uh, you know, Hamilton, you know, someone new, or maybe even you're debugging and you're trying to understand, you know, what connects with what, like it's easy, very easy to get this high level picture and then uh, walk through it. Um, and so in terms of, you know, reusability and say thinking about, okay, uh, uh, you know, a, a depth to production, right? Um, uh, this, this is just a Python function, right? There isn't anything special about it, right? Uh, and so this means this code can run anywhere that you run Python, right? And so uh, you can you know, develop and run stuff in a notebook. You can run it in a Python script. You can put it into an Airflow task or you know, array uh, with, uh, or PySpark or even you know, uh, some sort of Python web service. Um, and so this means that like the functions or features that you write are very portable. And, 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 and so uh, say you have an offline system, you can write functions there and then reuse them in the online system because it, it, um, Hamilton gives you that ability to 
A, reuse them, but then B, forces you to put them in a way that's, you know, into a module that is actually facilitates reuse in the first place. And so I uh, definitely have a bunch of blogs here uh, that, you know, go into more detail and depth as to like how you can write a re feature once and kind of reuse it in multiple places. Also, uh, for those who are using PySpark, there's a, sp a specific kind of, um, uh, uh, we have a blog post on that. Um, but just to kind of, you know, uh, let's compare the code um, um, uh, from earlier, right? Um, so in this earlier code, right, you know, this didn't have a great testing documentation, visualization, or, or lineage kind of, or even portability kind of story, right? And so what would this code look like in Hamilton? Um, in terms of, so I'm going to, I guess, walk through this, the first half, right? So one of the things you can kind of see is, you know, this, uh, this isn't all the code. So Hamilton is a little bit more verbose, right? But everything now is in, um, uh, 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 in functions. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, say loading data, like one of the things you want to do is we can kind of uh, A, specify a check output to ensure that, hey, the schema is uh, what we expect. So if something wants to break or uh, change in the upstream schema, we could, you know, fail early and catch it and ensure they're like, hey, uh, you know, we're not going to co compute bad features because our expectations change. We can then also, we're forced to like, if you want to do things, so Hamilton allows you to think in columns or, or, or data frames, it's kind of up to you. But for features, it's very easy. It's more natural to think in columns. Um, and so you can then, you know, actually explicitly say, hey, with load actuals, we're actually going to expose a few of these like raw features or raw columns so that then we can actually do computation. So it's easy then to kind of read this and go, okay, I understand what's being used from it. Um, you can kind of see here that in, in the prior code, we had this if else condition. And so if, if you have start to have lots of if else's, it's kind of, you have to mentally keep track of, you know, uh, what, what is the configuration and therefore what is the behavior? In Hamilton, you can pull this up to the top level. So we can actually conditionally um, uh, create features based on configuration. So if I'm doing things in the US or the UK, right, I can write very specific functions. So then this means that this function can have different dependencies. I can unit test it independently. Right? I don't have to deal with you know, uh, you know, worrying about configuration because this is kind of the framework kind of will um, pick the right one based on the inputs that you kind of provide. Uh, and then in terms of, you know, magic numbers or average through expand, like we actually then, you know, can, we have an actual function doc string where we can actually, you know, specify or annotate like three weeks is important because that is the average something time in the business, right? And so, um, uh, so now we have a standard way that we can, you know, place documentation and, and kind of describe things where, uh, where appropriate. Uh, the rest of the functions look pretty simple, uh, uh, but it's always very clear to understand specifically like what a feature is required and what it kind of depends on. And so therefore, uh, if you were to change something upstream, it's very then easy to find what depends on it downstream, right? And so uh, this code therefore then is, I want to say, in order of magnitude, easier to maintain and manage. Maybe, you know, it's a little more verbose, but then, you know, the, the payoff is in the iteration and reuse um, uh, down the line. Um, and so then, so just to somewhat comparing the code from earlier is that one is we can actually, you know, uh, everything's unit testable uh, as it wasn't before. Uh, everything's documentation friendly. We can have the doc string, right? Lineage is clear because you can understand the dependencies of what's, what, what things are kind of required. Uh, and then you can kind of get this visualization on the right, right? And so uh, you can then easily and clearly see like, oh, I didn't have to, uh, like, so if, uh, like you would, I would manually be drawing this picture if I was trying to understand this code, but this is something that you kind of, you know, this, this picture you kind of get for free. Uh, with Hamilton. Uh, and then the code is reusable, right? It's in a module, it's in a Python module. It's a known construct then to be able to kind of reuse it in, you know, uh, in different kind of contexts. Uh, and therefore, I want to say this will be, you know, you'll have a lot less headache maintaining uh, this code than you would uh, the other one. And uh, the cost to kind of do so in terms of development, I want to say is actually that much more, right? And so writing these functions isn't actually all that, uh, you know, that much more of an overhead than writing kind of that script-based form. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, Hamilton is not just for you know feature engineering, but the th the cool thing is that you can actually you know start to make uh, uh, break things up into into bigger into bigger Lego bricks, um, uh, and so it's very then easy to write a whole machine learning pipeline or some sort of LM pipeline where different uh, Python modules describe different parts of of your ecosystem, right? And so then it's um, uh, very easy then to kind of compose and actually so start small, start with feature engineering. And then if you want to expand it, right, you just write more, you know, Hamilton kind of modules to e either side to connect uh, your director day cyclic graph. And so, um, uh, so in which case it's then uh, Hamilton's very lightweight. So you can just start and just use it for feature engineering. But then, you know, if you want to do more with it, you can. If not, you don't have to. Um, the, and, and then 
uh, the down, there isn't really much of a downside because you're just still writing regular Python functions. So if you have some other context, you can still use those Python functions, um, you know, um, uh, however you would normally use, you know, a Python library, for example. Um, so I'll get to questions in a, in a sec, but otherwise, um, uh, in terms of you know, a quick recap of this talk, so uh, I could easily you know talk talk for much longer into the depths and details of Hamilton, but um, you know if, if for me you know feature engineering with Hamilton, um, uh, you know to summarize, Hamilton is it's a very lightweight library, right? Uh, that you declaratively uh, can express these kind of transforms, which are you know the bread and butter of what you do for feature engineering. Um, uh, and so uh, and then you know high level is you know write code that people aren't terrified of inheriting. So this is where you know my thesis is you could give. Hamilton to your intern, and they could write production code, and then no one would be terrified of inheriting things when they leave. Um, uh, the paradigm, so because Hamilton forces you to write code in a certain style, right? It is kind of like a paradigm. As a byproduct, you get these software engineering best practices, right? And I think this actually increases the value of, of your work, right? Because um, it's easier, A, to understand features. Everything is, yeah, again, testable, documentation friendly. Uh, you can draw a picture. Uh, you can reuse these features. So then, Things are more reusable, portable, and modular. So if you need to make a change of uh, just a specific thing, you know like which function to change it on, where it is, and then what, then you can under, identify what it impacts. Um, and effectively, it does this because it standardizes the way that you kind of write code and iterate on a code base. Um, and then it is lightweight, runs anywhere that Python runs. So this means that you can you know develop uh, wherever you develop Python. Uh, and then reuse it and deploy it uh, wherever in production that Python code needs to run. And so this means actually, depending on you know different companies, uh, different setups, but this is actually Hamilton can provide a pretty well-defined kind of interface for say a data science, even a data engineering team to uh, uh, operate or a data science and machine learning team to kind of collaborate because uh, functions are all standardized. Everything's uh, can be done in expressive modules. So then uh, it's then easy for uh, teams to kind of either, you know, inherit, delegate, or kind of, you know, reuse each other's work. Uh, just a quick note. So I'm trying to also, you know, I'm starting a company. And so the one thing that I'm adding on top of Hamilton is that if you uh, uh, need better handling of versioning, lineage, catalogs, and, and observability in terms of, you know, what's created and what the code is running, uh, I invite you to sign up for free and try it out at uh, Dagworks.io. You do have to be using Hamilton to make use of this, but, um, uh, and uh, otherwise I would love, love feedback there. Uh, but otherwise, um, I, you know, at the end of my talk, um, thanks for listening. Uh, definitely, uh, yeah, we'll, I'll make these slides available. Uh, there's also um, a bunch of you know, different links and content and documentation that like get you on your on your Hamilton journey, uh, and then otherwise I will uh, yeah, go through the Q and A now. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Stefan. The journey was wonderful to hear about uh, the development of Hamilton. So here we have a set of questions. Can I can I post your questions to you? Yeah, yes, please. Yeah, sure. So. One of our associates says, like, uh, Hamilton sounds amazing. She has two que two questions. One is, how was your journey of developing Hamilton as a CEO happen? Yeah, I mean, so uh, thankfully, so we developed Hamilton back at Stitch Fix, right? And so um, definitely got, you could say, good feedback from the users there. And so we, when we decided to open source it, we, you know, a bit of a thesis was that, hey, it's a, it's a bit unique and it's a bit of a different thing. And so we've already, Hamilton's already had impacts on other frameworks in terms of, uh, trying to provide a declarative way to kind of write things. And so Dagster being uh, an example that took inspiration from Hamilton for uh, some part of its feature set. Um, uh, but otherwise, uh, yeah, like the main friction, uh, I, I think we, we find with, with Hamilton adoption in general is like people are a little afraid of like, how does this actually change how I write code? Uh, because everyone you know likes to develop and develop things in their way. And so um, uh, uh, not too un uncommon friction. And so a lot of it is just, you know, giving people the time to actually, and the examples and uh, uh, the documentation. Uh, and this is where I need to actually create more videos, I think some more video content, but to make, you know, to show people that it's actually the activation energy is actually pretty small. Um, uh, there is a little bit of, you know, how do you frame and, and think on, on certain aspects with Hamilton? Uh, but yeah, we're always trying to improve documentation there to make that um, something that, you know, is easy to answer and to show people like, yeah, no, this is, this is possible. And this is, you know, how do you kind of do it? But that is the main uh, feedback you could say with Hamilton is, is that, you know, uh, uh, I like it, uh, I like it, but how do I get my colleagues to adopt it is, you know, um, uh, something that we, we encounter, in which case, you know, uh, we have, uh, I want to say a lot more documentation and content there that can help you champion Hamilton if you uh, want to win, win over your colleagues. 
Actually, that is what was uh, following up with her question. She also asked, what are the different types of feedback that you got from the clients? Like, how did you pitch your uh, uh, product yeah, and what was the different type of feedback? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. So like in terms of, um, if you think most teams to be more efficient, they need to standardize, right? And so invariably, I think there there's a little bit of like data science work is generally, um, you know, started by very technical, very, you know, like machine learning, data science are very uh, technically adept people who generally actually, because they come from say PhD backgrounds are very, you know, actually uh, great at working by themselves. Uh, but then in terms of longevity for code, it's actually a team thing, right? And so this is where, um, you know, trying to frame things as Hamilton being the the way that you can help standardize things without having to write and manage your own bespoke custom, uh, you know, feature, feature catalog or way that you express features. It's kind of the way that we'll be thinking about it. Um, but that is, um, uh, yeah, like, uh, what I want to say, if I was to talk to a manager or someone, uh, or the, the head of data science or machine learning, that's kind of that story resonates. And then because with LLMs now, you can also apply Hamilton, not only to data machine learning, but also LLM stuff. It's also um, the feedback is like, yeah, we, one tool set or one way that you can describe things uh, that, you know, express the DAG is, you know, then help standardize, makes things more efficient. And the team, you know, has this, then a shared common language to, to speak on. So that, that is the pitch that, um, you know, resonates with people. But the harder part is the implementation, getting people to, uh, you know, to change their ways a little to kind of adopt since, you know, um, uh, some people like to engineer their own constructs because they find it more of a challenge. But, you know, um, this is where I think over time, more open source standard, that's why you, that's why you should use open source because, you know, the, the, the standards can live for a lot longer than, what you potentially could come or construct in your own company, unless you're a big tech company like Google or someone who will always invest in their own kind of, you know, platform. That's definitely yes. true. Like following up with this question, I would like to also understand, like, what is the business value that is being added? Like, could you quote it? Uh, yeah. Value? So uh, productivity is, a, is hard to manage. So this is where, you know, uh, most data teams don't know how to measure themselves. Uh, so if I was to tell you, hey, I can make, I can make you 20% faster, like it's hard to say what value that is to business depending on your work, right? And so in the case of production code, um, uh, if you can quantify it in terms of, you know, uh, uh, how fast does it take to debug or, or re resolve things if, if they're fired? So that, that is a quantifiable cost that you can kind of measure of like how much people human time. The other is how many you know, iterations can you get out, right? And so can you then, you know, estimate like, well, if we uh, can build better models faster, we'll, we'll come and find something that lifts the business um, uh, you know, sooner, right? And so then th that is the kind of, you know, spreadsheet modeling you kind of need to do to show business. But um, at a high level, uh, I think this uh, Hamilton enables, um, you know, data science people to kind of, you know, or at least people who, uh, depending on how your company operates, to do more of the software engineering work because it's a simpler paradigm. There isn't anything to do. So in which case it's easier to, you could say, write more code uh, from the person who's developing it. And so, uh, so to me, it's like, we can make things more human capital efficient. So one team is more, it can do more. So therefore you can potentially, you know, uh, uh, you don't have to pair quite as much engineering talent or support to get something to production, right? Because if everything's standardized and the whole team standardizes it, then the engineering support has everything already standardized for them. And then they, you don't need quite as many of them to help support, you know, the team. So uh, it's along, you know, uh, uh, um, so the open source side is yeah, all along trying to make teams more efficient and more human capital efficient by giving a standardized kind of way to do things. It's a good question, but like, yeah, uh, hard one to answer for each team though. Yeah. Okay. So uh, do we follow any coding standard over here? Like Hamilton seems to be like a Python framework. Is there any coding standard which was taken as a reference and then developed on top of it? Or uh, um, is that I mean, Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, the main task was, can we make things unit testable, documentation friendly, and so you could understand what connects. And so, um, uh, Hamilton, I mean, like my, my, I'm a computer scientist by, by, by background. And so in which case for me, uh, having a great, you know, operational story or, or software development lifecycle story is really kind of what drove the design goals of Hamilton. And so that's really, um, I want to say there was, uh, uh, no, no, no framework that inspired me other than I wanted to keep things simple. Cause I believe Python functions are really you know, great. Uh, you don't need much object oriented code in, in, in the data world in terms of uh, defining you know, transforms and so functions uh, are pretty well contained and so in which case that 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 was really uh, you could say more functional thinking if anything was 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 trying to uh, drive some of the things of, of Hamilton here but without you having to buy into a full functional paradigm if you if you have experience there um, and so that's kind of you know 
yeah, what I took inspiration from to kind of, you know, help design and build Hamilton. Uh, so I see there's a, a, a question from Rebecca. Uh, when do feature engineering, when doing feature engineering, we often try to automate the features, testing. Should this feature be divided by 5, 10, 10, or 100? Uh, can you quickly ex explain how Hamilton can be used in these situations? Um, so, uh, so Hamilton has uh, the ability to parameterize a function. So you can kind of, um, uh, in, in, in that case, um, uh, uh, you can create fe different features that one would be divide by five, 10, 100, right? And so you could, you could create a superset of all possible things. Uh, and so then determining whether it's useful or not is up to you because you have to build the model and kind of measure it. But at least in Hamilton, you can kind of structure it in a way that um, uh, you can easily kind of create and add these features. And then, um, and then I guess the, if you really want to delete code, Hamilton can give you the, you know, the, the impact statement, or at least you can, you can easily figure out what you're going to impact. Um, uh, uh, in terms of, you know, base pipeline and kind of grid search, uh, uh, for sklearn, for example, uh, it kind of Hamilton, the one thing to wrap your head around Hamilton is like what level you're kind of thinking in, right? And so, uh, you can think of one directed acyclic graph being, um, uh, one, one model fitting kind of run, right? Um, but Hamilton does have constructs where you can kind of parameterize a, a, a graph, right? And so uh, if you wanted, if you um, know the grid and the search you want to do ahead of time, you can actually create a whole parameterized graph that then Hamilton will go and kind of compute for you. So uh, that that is an extremely, I guess, uh, uh, that is a great question. Um, um, and so this is where I, I'd, I'd say reference uh, documentation, but suffice to say, there's a few ways to kind of approach kind of what you're doing. Uh, uh, and then depending on where you're computing, there are hooks there to like, Hey, I want each of my, uh, uh grid search, you know, parameterizations to run on Ray. Right. And so Hamilton does have constructs to kind of, to do that, but you have to, um, uh, the main question is depending, uh, what are you optimizing for is, is part of like the, the, the way that I think as to like how you'd set up in Hamilton, but, uh, suffice to say, uh, I want to say, yes, you can, you can kind of, uh, to do that and do that in a, in a structured way. And if you if that didn't make sense, Rebecca, do feel free to uh, um, yeah ask again or ask a clarifying question. We'll jump on to the next question from Alice. She has a part of code which is which was shown in the slide, and she wants to ask what's the purpose of adding PD series? Uh, is it required? Yes, yes, a good question. So I didn't I didn't touch on this. So Hamilton, um, uh, oh, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Code example, um, uh, yeah. So like, so ha with Hamilton, you actually force you have to annotate, type annotate uh, the inputs and outputs, because Hamilton will do a lightweight, um, uh, you know, when it constructs the graph to make sure that like, hey, these things are the same types or at least compatible types, and they're um, uh, not going to conflict, right? And so, in which case, if, if if one of these end up being a data frame, and I think it's a series, right? Hamilton was like, hey, you actually can't construct this graph because your types don't match. So that is kind of how um, Hamilton is using types. Uh, we actually have um, uh, some, you know, uh, we're looking to expand the type kind of uh, system. And so in which case, if you wanted to annotate more expectations on types, we can then also use that as a way to kind of do input and output type checking. Um, but that is really, you know, like I think uh, aids and readability as well as to kind of, you know, why, why you have these type annotations. And so um, uh, Hamilton helps kind of therefore make sure that the graph is constructed and then gives us a, an avenue to then do more sophisticated type checking at runtime. Um, uh, 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 yeah, uh, as needed. Good, good question, Alice. Anyone else have any more From questions? This, yeah, I have a question. From the session, I understand like Hamilton is quite useful not only for time for time series forecast and also it would be helpful for the unstructured data. Like, uh, could you explain more about it? Yeah, I mean, so if you can draw, you know, a, a, a set of processes that you want to take your data and transform it, right? And so with Hamilton, you can directly model that as you know, different functions and then different dependencies, right? And so um, any any Python object type, any kind of data type that you can uh, kind of model in this way. So, you know, that's why you can do web request kind of modeling with Hamilton. You get a web request in, you want to take the data, transform it, maybe go to a database, pull something out, change it, do a prediction or something, right? Hamilton, uh, you, you can kind of, if you can describe it as a directed acyclic graph, you can kind of, you know, uh, uh, put it into Hamilton and, and run it. Um, do you have a more specific 
question there, but that's the, that's the high level kind of way that I, that I think about it. That answers my question. Could you say more about the cost of maintenance? Like uh, we just touched upon the topic, but we did not elaborate more on it. Yeah. Yeah, so um, uh, I, so in terms of maintenance, right? I think in terms of uh, the way that I'm interpreting the question is, you know, uh, people come and go, right? Um, there is, uh, I think, in my um, uh, the world moves, right? If you have something running in production, like say data moved, or hey, the product now has uh, a new set of client features or inputs, and these old ones are deprecated, and I need to go update my pipelines or something along those natures. Kind of generally what you know, how I'm interpreting maintenance, right? Um, the one thing that with Hamilton that you can do is like, because um, uh, you're grouping things into Python modules, right? Hamilton actually gives you a very easy way to kind of add, change, or update, or, or switch them out. So for example, if uh, you are moving just, for, you know, moving databases or something, right? The idea with Hamilton is that the only functions you'd need to change would be the data loading functions because they're the only ones who are coupled or dependent on like what database you're using. The downstream features shouldn't care they're decoupled because all, all they need is uh, you know the right data with the right type to kind of satisfy and, and kind of run things and so um, and so in terms of maintenance you know one of the things is yeah like Hamilton enables you to more easily then to like be very surgical with what the change is or like swap out an entire module for a different one right and so um, that, that's where that is uh, in terms of you know testing, you can build a CI or continuous integration pipeline that you know when things run, you can obviously have all the tests and integration tests you want, right? To help make sure catch and, and, and make sure that things don't break. Um, but uh, yeah, that that's kind of you know the the high level of what I see Hamilton helping facilitate with maintenance because uh, say there's an issue and you need to debug it, right? Then the, then at least you can more easily trace or understand like uh, where things came from and how things connected so then you know it makes a discovery of what needs to change uh easier uh and then uh if you need to add more you know expectations and you know this is what i was saying with like the the check output annotation with schema stuff like you can actually add that in so then you know next time you're catching it early and and you know, and therefore know exactly like what changed or what has changed that has that then you need to you know either go talk to another team to fix or, or fix the code yourself uh, this does that visual... make sense? Definitely. This visualization is quite uh, interesting. Actually, we do the street viz like kind of thing for understanding the feature, like dissecting the feature and understanding it to do a feature engineering. Now, I mean, on an alternative path, this is quite interesting to know about the feature, like where it is placed and what are the dependencies for it, and with which we will be able to do uh, feature selection at a better way, I believe. So. Consolidating, yeah, I mean, yeah, please. Yeah, I was gonna say, say, feature selection is just about, yeah, like what is the data set you're creating, right? And so, um, uh, and so Hamilton gives you a few options to like flexibly kind of create and do that dynamically, right? And so then this means that, uh, yeah, when something runs, it's very clear as to what paths, what features. And then if you connect this with Git and you crack the Git commit SHA, then you also then have a very lightweight way to then like, hey, I did feature selection. And as long as you store the pointer of like what that state in the code is, you'll always be then assuming you have the the you store you know the the source data in a way you always then be able to go back and kind of recreate it as well so it's then easy to uh, as as things go over time you know understand and actually go back in time to to you know recreate something if you need to um, because as long as you kind of store with, with Git and uh, you know track things because it's all it's all you know lineage as code. Okay. So I have one more question. Like uh, we were speaking about the testing and documentation part. Is Hamilton capable of generating automated code as test scripts? Uh, we, I mean, um, it, it, we have an issue out on the repository to help bootstrap unit tests. So if you think about um, uh, like these functions and now I, like, and, and you want to write unit tests, like the boilerplate to, to write, uh, to set this up, like, we kind of have all the details, right? So there is an issue open to kind of have a command line that can give and given up uh, some Python code bootstrap unit tests. Uh, and then I want to say now with LLMs, you can actually, this is where, you know, we, we can actually write an integration. So if you give the open AI key, you know, it's on the, uh, we could then potentially even help you auto generate the first version or, or something of those tests, because I mean, with Hamilton, things are pretty descriptive. And so this is a lot of context that you could potentially 
uh, you know, provide the LLM to, to generate tests for. And so definitely see, uh, you know, paths and things in the future that we can kind of more easily streamline the, the testing story. Definitely. It sounds interesting. And we would definitely would be uh, excited to hear more about your generative AI, AI or LLM based approach that Hamilton has handled. Like if there is any story that uh, uh, helps us, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I want to say uh, if you're doing retrieval augmented generation, um, uh, the uh, uh, it's very easy to model in Hamilton of getting a document, going it through some processing pipeline of chunking document, uh, going to a vector embedding and then putting it into a vector store. So I want to say that is that is a nice use case of Hamilton. And then, um, but otherwise, uh, uh, yes, if you're doing LLM stuff, I want to say yeah, also take take a look at Hamilton. I can definitely. Uh, we have some blogs as well that I can point people towards on. Um, so if you go to uh, blog, um, uh, dotagworks.io, you can kind of see, um, I, I wrote a one yesterday on, on kind of rag ingestion, but we have uh, a lot of different blogs, a lot of different topics. So if you're using IPython uh, notebooks, we actually have a Jupyter Magic that can help um, you develop and kind of see Hamilton stuff. So I, uh, I would say if you go to our blog and you don't find what you want, let me know. But like um, there, there's a little uh, search button here that you can kind of, uh, search for things that have, uh, you know, LLMs. So we do have posts on, you know, building in a, uh, a modular LLM stack. So if that's also something of interest, there's, there's definitely, we got, hopefully got content to get you started. I think we can wrap up the session. We are good uh, with the information that you've shared. It was quite informative and energizing for us in terms of uh, its application perspective. Like uh, it can, it can go around from normal ML based application till LLM. So, which is quite uh, interesting for us to know. Uh, Stefan, we had a wonderful time with you having speaking about Hamilton and its perspective and different perspective that it can help us in the bringing the scalability deployment uh, deployment based approach and the reusability of the code. I think uh, we have we would have more hands on session in future with you. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for coming uh, coming into our session and giving us insights about Hamilton. Yes, your thank final you. thoughts. No, thank you for having me. Um, I want to say, yeah, if you like Hamilton, would, would love a star on GitHub. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, we are, feel free to join the Slack community. You'll find me there. I'll say hello. Uh, and otherwise, yeah, uh, uh, it was a pleasure uh, Yeah, talking about this. So um, thanks, everyone.